We're going to get started. Um, thank you guys for coming this evening. I'm Julie Cahill of Shane, one of the school counselors in the guidance office, um, one of three. And we're fortunate tonight to have uh, Marie Tomato, my apologies, representing NEPA. Um, and Marie uh, brings a wealth of experience in regards to the college application process. Uh, for, since 2005, she's been working in higher ed in the IT area um, and developing uh, the state's equivalent of what we have as Naviance. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to you and chat with you guys at the end. So I will pass around an attendance sheet so we have a, an understanding of who's, who's here this evening. Um, and there is a PowerPoint that somewhat, if you raise your hand, I can hand it to you if you're already seated. And we will ask you to fill out an evaluation from Marie at the end. So again, thank you. Thanks. Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. I know there were some um, competing events this evening, so I appreciate that you made this a priority. Um, and I'm always excited when there are students in the audience along with parents, so that's great. Um, I'm assuming you're students, not young parents yourself, so feel free to correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but tonight we have a handful of topics that we're going to go through. There will be some financial aid um, intermittent throughout, but really if you are um, focused on questions related to paying for college, I would recommend coming to the fall and um, later in the spring sessions that are hosted by NEPA. Those get very specific as it relates to um, either completing the FAFSA or paying for specific components of college. So just by way of hands, how many folks in the audience are um, either in junior or sophomore year? Okay, great. Do we have any seniors? Perfect. Okay, great. Perfect, perfect. So you are in the right time to be talking about college planning as it relates to um, researching college and starting to build that college list. Um, next year, all of that stuff about financial aid that I just mentioned will be a lot more relevant. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about just the background and trends in applications and building that college list talk about visiting campus and the different ways that you can start to get acquainted with campuses um, that are available that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to step foot on campus, what opportunities there are. The process of applying, we'll talk a little bit about financial aid and then we'll talk about some of the state resources. Um, if there are any NEPA spies in here tonight, I will just admit that I will probably gloss over a lot of the plugs for the state resources. They are in all of the handouts and the information that you have. Um, but you know, truth be told, there is a lot of information available on things like NEPA.org. Um, and they do a really good job on their social media presence. So as much as um, financing college and paying for college can be a very dry topic, um, their social media it does a good job of providing just-in-time information. So I would say that as you get closer to senior year and having to start thinking about the tactical um, aspects of paying, filling out the FAFSA, filling out the forms, signing up for um, their news feed or following them is a good idea. Just those incremental chunks. So trends in college admissions. Um, the number one trend overall is that the process is a lot earlier than a lot of us went through, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So the fact that you are here as juniors and sophomores is exactly um, where you should be. And so students are also applying to a greater number of schools. And when we say that, it's primarily because of the nature of competition. So if you are looking at some um, very competitive programs. The more competitive programs you're looking at, the higher the number of school students are tending to apply to. Um, that's also where you tend to see the earlier applications being concentrated, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later in the presentation. Um, the other aspect is that admission to public institutions is a lot more competitive than it used to be. So uh, when I went to college in the mid-90s, as long as you had a pulse and graduated, you were pretty much <laughs> admitted institution to the state you know, flagship. That is not the case anymore. Um, so you know, being very mindful of where you're looking to go and what the requirements are early on is important. Um, the process has become parent-driven. 
that is a trend that is not necessarily a trend that's being accepted by the higher education community, but it is something that there is a general awareness of. <coughs> and the rise of social media is playing um, a role in college admissions overall, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We do acknowledge globalization here, um, and primarily because it has an aspect as it relates to the college, um, how colleges fund their enterprise, right? So there are more international students coming to the United States despite the political environment, and part of the reason for that is because when they come, they are paying full freight prices to colleges and universities, and it's no normally a cash proposition. So when you're looking at that, just be mindful if you're wondering why is the international component so high, it, there's usually something going on deeper in the college's um, business dynamics, so they're accepting more um, international students to offset that. And lack of authentic communication. This is something that we'll highlight uh, multiple times throughout the presentation, and it really comes back to the fact that colleges can see many students lack the ability to send an email, have a phone conversation, just those very kind of baseline interpersonal skills that I'm sure you know, you've know you heard of, the soft skills, all of those things, right? So these are things that college admissions counselors are looking for, they are assessing. They're not things that are in the college application, they're not things that are being scored, um, but when an applicant demonstrates them, they're things that are being noted. So just be mindful of. So developing the college list, this is really where everything begins and where the research starts. So the first thing we talk about is the need to be organized. And thinking about how you're going to, going to organize this process up front will serve dividends in the end. Um, there is going to be a inordinate amount of information coming at you, um, and the reality is that there will be deadlines, there will be information, um, notifications that you need to stay on top of. We realize that students don't monitor email the way that they might need to as part of this process. So one of the things that we suggest, just as an idea, is potentially setting up a family email address. Um, so, you know, something that everybody can check. Setting up a family calendar, something that everybody can get notifications of. When are the deadlines? When are things due? Um, you know, that can be something that is <coughs> pen and paper in your kitchen. It can be something that's shared online. Whatever works for you and your family, um, but start thinking about that now because it will be helpful long term. Um, and then moving into the actual where to look for colleges. So there's any number of sites out there, there's the college websites as well, um, but here are some that we recommend because we know that the data behind the website is valid and um, really kind of approved on multiple levels. So College Scorecard is something that the federal government um, is behind and the number one reason why we like this one is because it has the graduation rate, it also has the three and five year um, employment rate following graduation for each of the institutions, and the average alumni salary by, um, yeah, by major, sorry. Um, so this is a really good one if you're looking for that throughput. Some of these other ones, like Big Future, Big Futures is great. This is a college board product, um, and I would say from a student perspective, if you are looking for interactive tools, you know things that will help you think through the questions you need to be asking when you're looking for a college, really thinking through that fit, that is a this is a more student friendly site. Um, so it's really, you know, some of these are more parent focused, some of them are more student focused, so try a couple. Um, but there are definitely a number of what I would call aggregator sites out there where you can go and look at multiples side by side. Um, Naviance, which is the college planning tool that your school has, I'm sure many of you are familiar. If not, you will be getting familiar this and next year. Um, that is also a place that will bring you to many of many of these colleges all at once. Um, so from there we are going to go into balancing the college list. So as you are thinking through what you want to do, let me go back um, for one minute because 
the reason why we want the students to go to some of these sites, so I'm going to take big futures for a second, kind of back up. Um, you know, when you are 15, 16, 17 years old, and somebody says, you know, do you want to stay close and go to college, or do you want to go far away? If somebody had asked me that question, I would have been like, I want to go as far away as humanly possible. Um, so, so a lot of these sites take it in a more kind of hands-on approach of putting students in situations. Do you want to be able to come drop off your laundry and pick it up next weekend? Or do you only want to be able to come home if you get on planes, trains, and automobiles? Uh, so more kind of situational to then be able to put it in context back to the student of, okay, got it, you want to get away from your parents and your family, but here's what that actually means. So here's some potential options. So it's, all these tools are really just about contextualizing it to give students an understanding of what the decisions that they are about to make actually mean in the long run. Um, because that is the information that they really need in order to then start to build the college list. And the college list is really all about the fit. So. Fit is going to be a word that you're likely going to hear um, more than you ever thought before in the next few years. Um, so there's more to going to college than just picking the right major in the right school. It really needs to be about that feeling that you get when you are on campus, when you are with other people who are on that campus, and whether it is a place that you feel like you are at home and that you can thrive. So. Those are all the things that we're talking about when we're talking about fit. The other pieces of fit are really um, kind of in the background that students definitely don't think about, but you as parents and family members are going to think about. Um, and that starts now with the financial fit. So if your student you know, is 1,000% in love with an institution, but there is just no way that you would ever be able to fund that education, this is the time to have that kind of candy conversation because there's going to be that rub and ultimately um, you know, things may not work out. So finance is part of that fit conversation as well. Um, part of balancing that list is doing the side-by-side -side comparison. Those tools that we showed earlier and Naviance as well will allow you to put the institutions side-by-side. -side. Um, so what you can't see here, but you can imagine exists, is in you know the first column you have things like the major you want to take, your SAT scores um, or your ACT scores. Um, you have your class rank, GPA, all of that, and then um, other things. So maybe you want a rural college with a certain number of um, you know, uh, teacher ratio or all of the different things that they have for um, search criteria in the back of the system. And then you can have up to three to five institutions side by side and see which ones match and which ones don't, which ones are close and which ones aren't. That will, will allow you to just hone in, you know, maybe you thought something was a fit that isn't. Um, so it's just another visual way to look and see, um, you know, where, where you are at. The key criteria um, are really those things, or it's that balance of the personal achievement and the aspiration. So yes, you may have done everything absolutely right up to this date in terms of your um, scores, your test scores, your classes, but that is not, those are not the only things that you're looking for a school on. So if the school don't have those kind of aspirational components that you're looking for, it will not be a fit long term. Um, and then when we look at that college list, the college list should really start off big, right? So let's say it starts off maybe 20, 30 colleges that there's a fit of some kind there. Um, over the next 12, 18 months, you are going to, well, less than that, um, you are going to narrow that down to the list of schools that you will likely apply to. So it's going to go from the colleges I like to the colleges I'm going to apply to list. And we tend to talk about that in terms of the probable schools. So the ones that you have a really strong chance of getting into based on your personal demographic, all the things that you've achieved and how you line up. And at least one of those schools on that list needs to be affordable for you. Um, the target schools are those that might be a little bit of a stretch. You know, Based on all of your research, it's a 50-50 shot. There's no reason why you shouldn't get in 
but you know they may be a little bit more competitive, so it's a 50-50. And then the REACH are anything over a 50% chance for admission. So we would put all of the IVs into this category. So you could have done everything correct, and, but the problem is everybody else applying has done everything correct. Um, so the more that you have in this bucket, the more you're going to need in everything else. And this, so now we're back to the, you know, why people are applying to more colleges um, trend. So any questions on this part before we kind of move on? How exactly are you determining what your probability is? So we're basing it Three. based, yeah. Great. We're basing it based on all of the published information. So if they're saying, you know, GPAs, if you line up with the GPA, if you line up with the test scores, if you line up with all of the requirements, I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't get in. It comes down to that percentage rate. They accept, let's say they accept one of two. That's where the gray area is going to come in. If they have a really competitive um, acceptance rate where it's like one in 10, you're going to go in this category. So, yeah. <clears throat> so visiting campus is the next piece. Um, and when we talk about this, a lot of people really immediately jump to that traditional campus tour. Um, and that is definitely one part of it. But there are a number of different types of campus visits. So we like to go beyond the brochures, the websites, um, and talk about the types of things that you should be looking for when you are on campus. Um, informal visits are a great way to start to think about whether or not you might be a fit for a certain type of college. Um, so you know, you're here, there are a number of institutions within 25 miles. Go sit at the student union for two, three hours, have coffee, hang out. This is that like totally uncomfortable time that you have to spend with your child or your parents um, and have that conversation about, so how do you feel? What's going on around here? Like that type of informal visit, right? Walk around, hang out in the library and see what does it feel like to be on campus versus the formal visit, which is when you are going there, you are getting a tour you are very clearly on somebody's agenda to be sold something, which isn't necessarily bad, but just be mindful of the fact that there's two different um, things going on. These formal visits, you will get to see certain activities, you'll be able to access housing, you'll have an opportunity to you know, participate in specific Q&A sessions. The informal visits, you can make of it you know, what you will, but they just tend to have a different, um, different opportunity and that's where you might be able to identify the fit piece and the culture really. This university TV that's listed, this, is, um, this probably isn't in your printed versions. This is a website that you can use. I think it's really helpful if you have students who are looking for colleges that are way out on the west coast or in a different part of the country. Um, they have gone around, last I checked, there were close to about 1,000. They conducted walking tours of colleges that are about 20 minutes long each that go in and it'll do things like go in from the student perspective, show you the student union, talk about different things that happen during the week, and then go to a different part of campus, go into the library, go into a residence dorm. And they're all shot from the student perspective, quite literally. Um, a number of people I used to work with used to call this used to be like the place that you wanted to work if you were in your mid-20s because it's where all the hot chicks were. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they did a really nice um, job in terms of production and they do represent the colleges in a nice way. So if you want that same on-the-ground vibe, that's a good website to be able to check out. And it's a third party. You have to watch a lot of Coca-Cola videos, but it's a third party who did it. It's not the college itself. College fairs are another way that we talk about visiting the college, um, but has anybody here been to the boat show or anything? Yeah, okay, so after about like five or six boats, they all look the same and you're ready to have a cocktail. So the college fair is very much the same. Um, you go, there are several hundred colleges there. If you're going to one of the national ones in Boston or someplace else, you need to go with a plan. Um, you need to go with that list of colleges you want to talk to first and go hit those colleges and then backfill afterwards um, because it will be overwhelming. 
the amount of institutions there. Um, however, and I don't know what how this high school manages it, I know usually in September, October, November of next year, a lot of high schools have colleges come in at different points in time during lunch hour and there's more intimate opportunities. Those or smaller regional college fairs, those you will tend to have um, more time, be a little bit less overwhelming, but again, just be thoughtful of um, you know the environment and have a plan on how to approach it. All right, so we are at the point of the application itself. Are there any questions on the research process, the college list, how to kind of narrow it down? All right. So. Oh, it doesn't like that I didn't move anything. So the application, um, the college list is, you're going to have multiple places where you will keep that. You can keep that in those um, organizational tools that we talked about, but really at this point, um, you, the application, I should say, is when you are going to come back to all of those organizing tools that we started talking about in the beginning. Um, because there are going to be a number of deadlines that start now. Um, the thing about applications is that if you have a specific major that you know you are going to be applying for, a stated major on the application, you need to be paying very, very close attention to the deadlines and the program specific deadlines. So things like nursing, engineering, business programs, those are usually the top three that will have more specific requirements than others. And when I say requirements, what I mean is a lot of times they require you to apply for um, early action or early decision and that is your only option. So UMass Lowell, for instance, if you want to apply for the nursing program, you have to apply early and that is your only option. So you miss it, you're out for that year. Um, so just be very careful. And the other piece about timelines is you, if you are looking for, um, what is the word, for merit aid, that is also something based on each individual school, they apply merit aid differently. So the institution that you're looking to go to, check and see which application deadline um, sorry, not deadline, which application option they suggest for merit aid based applications. Um, however, your typical application options are, oh, we skipped ahead a little bit, but that's okay. Um, your typical application options are these, which are going to be regular, which is what most of us used when we went to school, the ones that are you know, probably around this time of the year or um, a little bit earlier, so you know, January, February time frame. Early action, which is earlier, but um, non-binding. Early decision, which is earlier, but it means that if you get accepted, you're committed to going to that school. And then rolling admissions and open admissions. Um, rolling admissions, the benefit to this is that as you apply and you are accepted, you know a lot sooner. Um, open admissions, for most programs, um, the most comparable or the best scenario for open admissions would be your standard community college. Um, I add a detail slide to this because <coughs> it's so complicated um, now between early decision and early action that it usually warrants um, some detail and I tend to get tripped up on it so now I just put it in writing. Um, early decision is the one that is most binding out of all of them. This is the one where if you know with everything in your being that you are going to University of Vermont, if you are accepted and your parents will pay for it and it does not matter, you can apply to that um, early decision timeline. It's usually around Thanksgiving. You will probably have your notification um, maybe by Christmas, maybe a little bit after, depends on the year. The caveat here is that they do consider it to be binding. And the question that I always get is, well, how do they hold you responsible? Um, 
don't know how they hold you responsible, but what I do know is the guidance counselor has to sign off on the application, parents have to sign off on the application as well as the student. So it's not as simple as the student just sends in the application. There's levels of um, you know, sign off and accountability, if you will, that go along with it. So the expectation is that you have fully vetted your option, you've used the financial aid tools that are available, which will show a couple of um, net price calculators and things like that to understand what you are likely going to be expected to pay, and you've done your research. Um, because they're basically taking a spot away from somebody else in the pool, which is why they're asking you to commit. Early action, um, there's a couple of different types. Restricted means that you are not going to apply to any other schools after you get accepted. And unrestricted means that you can continue to apply to other schools even if you are accepted. Um, these, these are just really nice to have. So, you know, you can still apply early, weigh your options. Again, it's just um, nice to know that you've been accepted someplace. And sometimes with early action, you will be, or early decision, I should say, any of the earliest, you will be accepted, um, excuse me, you will not be accepted, but you will be deferred into the regular pool, which means when everybody else with the regular deadline um, gets their notice, you could ultimately be accepted. So you could have applied back in November, been denied, and then come February, March, get an acceptance letter. And is this universal? Every school offers these? Um, I don't know. Every, no, most. But it's really, it's sometimes it's program specific. Uh, but most of them have at least one of these. They might not have both. They probably have one of the others. So the application format types, the ones that you've most likely heard of are the Common Application and maybe the Coalition app. Um, the Common App probably has around 900 or so uh, colleges on it at this point, and the Coalition App is maybe around 150. Um, really, what it is is one, if you think about it from a system perspective, it is 900 colleges have decided, oh hey, we actually ask all the same questions. How about if we just put it in one interview format online for students to answer, and then we'll map it back to all of our individual systems? Because that's pretty much what happens. The reality is that you still have to fill out supplemental things like essays and whatnot. <coughs> um, so that's really what these are. Um, there are still individual colleges that maintain their own application on their own site. And there are still, last I checked, there was still a holdout of maybe two dozen colleges in the United States who only took a paper application. So if you're applying to one of those, make sure you realize they only take a paper application. Um, the most common materials that you're going to have to submit with your paper, with your not paper application likely, is your transcript, your test scores, and your letter of recommendation. The majority are, of these are going to be requested and sent with a click of a button, likely inside Naviance or from the guidance counselor's office. But they are things that you are going to have to track um, that you have done. So either inside your Navion system or inside um, whatever tracking mechanism you decide to use at your house, you'll need to manage them for each application that you're submitting. And also um, for, most likely for, definitely for financial aid and for um, scholarship applications too. So this is really kind of relevant to all applications. So academic readiness, um, I'm not really sure why this is in the application section, but when you are thinking of applying, there's a couple things that come into mind. You, if you would not spend $50 to apply to that school, you should not click the button in the Common App because there's a lot of schools who have waived the application fee but what happens is when students go into the Common App or the Coalition App and now all of these colleges are together, they're like, oh, I'll just apply to this one and this one and this one too, just in case. So this is just one of those things to keep in mind. Um, the other piece is the academic readiness that students are being weighed against when the application goes into the um, process. They're going to be looking for, did the student take good classes? 
So did they get good grades, but did they also challenge themselves? And that's really what they mean by rigor. Did they take challenging classes for them as an individual? Not, you know, did you take honors or AP or this or that? Well, what, what, what was the threshold for that student based on what they were achieving? Um, that goes through senior year. So they can rescind, admission, rescind admissions if you were admitted early or if something happens at the tail end of senior year and they see that. Um, your admissions decision can always be taken back at the very last minute. Um, they do have an interest in improvement over time, so that is something that is looked upon favorably, as well as exceeding minimum requirements for admission. Um, and relevance to post-secondary aspirations. So when we talk to admissions counselors, the one thing that they can't stand is looking at essays and applications that just you know, talk about how I can't wait to be a nurse and I can't wait to change the world and do all this stuff and then they bring somebody in for an interview and the person's never set foot in a hospital or they've never taken a biology class or things that just don't line up. So having the, all of the pieces line up is something that they do look for. Um, and then the sliding scale, this is more for you all to be mindful of. Um, there is that sliding scale for admissions to mass public colleges. So going back to an earlier comment, it's a minimum GPA of 3.0 now for a state college or university, or a combination of a 2.0 GPA, or between 2.0 and 2.99, and then a specific um, combination on the test scores. So you have to have one or the other in order to meet the bare minimum to get into a Massachusetts four-year institution. And the other thing that the application will be looking at is the standardized test scores. So PSAT, they will not be looking at, but just because we're in standardized tests. Um, SAT or ACT, they're both measuring for readiness, and I think at this point, most colleges across the country accept either or. It used to be separated by geography, and Massachusetts was very clearly a um, SAT state, but at this point, either one is accept acceptable. The thing to note about standardized tests is that there's over a thousand schools at this point that are test optional. So if you don't test well, there's a possibility that there's still a school out there for you that you don't have to send your test to. Um, the other thing is that if you're not sure if you want to send your tests, you need to be very careful, or your student needs to be very careful on the day that you go to take your test that you do not automatically sign up to have them sent. Because if the school is test optional, it means that you don't have to send them. If you sign up to send them and they are sent, they will be evaluated. So if the test shows up at the school, it's getting attached to your record and considered. If the test does not show up at the school, it won't be considered. So um, just of note, the at least the SAT folks like to do things like tell you it'll be free to have the test score sent if you sign up today. Do not sign up to have the test score sent. Pay the extra $5 later down the line you decide to. Um, activity list and resume. So these are one of those attachments that you're going to send. Um, you know, the obvious things that you have done um, after school activities, if you were part of band, if you were in a sport. Um, but if those things don't apply to your student, that is okay. The rule of thumb is think about what you did after three o'clock and that's what goes into your activity list and your resume. So it could be that you were helping on the family front, it could be that you were working, it could be that you were doing something in the community. It doesn't matter what it was, but the college wants to understand what the impact you were having was. So it's not the activity, it's the impact. Um, and that is really important to show um, you know, just that other side of you. Family responsibilities and employment are as important as extracurricular school-based activities. And then the essay, that's gonna be one of the final components that will go along with the application. Um, the essay is important because it's really the only part of that application package 
that is personal. So up until this point, everything that the student has sent is a score, a number, a letter, something. Um, this is where you have the opportunity to put context around that and to tell a story. And if you are telling a story, the story needs to be about the current self, the current student today. Um, that's kind of the number one thing that we hear from admissions counselors. It doesn't need to be about you know why, what happened in the past. Just talk about, focus on now and going forward. Um, and make it meaningful and personal. And this is a very fine line. Um, because you know we have a tendency sometimes to overshare, so we have to walk that line. If you were, if you were able to you know tell the story with a straight face at the Thanksgiving table, then you're probably okay. If you would not tell the story with your grandmother at the table, then you probably shouldn't submit it as your essay. Was what one of the um, admissions counselors said one time. So you know it should stand out. Again, they read hundreds and thousands of these a year, you need to stand out. Um, and it's okay if you had not, have not had a life-changing experience by the time you're 17 years old, that's not what they expect. What they expect is that you have some idea of what you want in your experience at their institution, and you have the ability to articulate what you are going to get out of your experience at their institution. That's really what they want to come through. Um, yep, and to the extent that you can write your essay early and have time to really focus on tweaking it, getting feedback from others, evolving it over time, um, you know, I know that's a lot easier said than done, but it really is important if, if you or your students, sorry for saying you, I'm used to talking to students. Um, what I will say is that the Common App has not changed their essay questions in three years. So here are your essay questions. Um, you have a year to work on them. Your students have a year to work on them. Um, and the last time they changed them, they like changed some words. They didn't change the content of the questions. So these are a really good place to start um, thinking. I'm sure you can't see them. Um, if you go to the Common Apps website, they were just posted uh, maybe two or three weeks ago but they are the same seven questions that they have been the last few years. Um, so the rule of thumb is download them before summer and think about them so that when you come back from the summer you can start writing. Um, same with letters of recommendation. So your recommenders will love you if you ask for a letter of recommendation at the beginning of next year and not in January or February when everybody else is asking for one. Um, the sooner you can give people notice that you would really be honored for them to write that recommendation for you, the better, A, the better letter you're likely to get because they'll have more time to think through it. Um, but you will also have more time to ask them specifically what it is that you would like them to touch on. So one thing that is really good when you're asking somebody for a letter of recommendation, you know what it is that you are submitting to the school. It's okay to say, you know, look, I'm writing about this in my essay, and here are the things that I want the school to understand about me. Share that with the person that you're asking to write so that they have some structure. Otherwise, they're just pulling from thin air and hoping to land in the right place for you. Um, I'm sure that these are things, these are typically things that are baked into the <coughs> senior year, high school, um, English curriculum or some other class, but they are things that you can be thinking about early. Um, and following up with a thank you, you know, a handwritten thank you card, um, that's usually something that puts it over the top. Um, interviews are not required, if they, but if they are offered or they are recommended, then we say it's something that you should definitely do. So there are going to be very few programs that are going to offer interviews, mostly your business programs and specialty programs. Um, but this is going to be an area where if they, again, if they offer it, you should take advantage of it. Um, and something that I usually touch on earlier is that there's this new, in the last five years, I would say there's this new statistic that, um, guide, or, sorry, 
yeah, admissions counselors are using to in the application process, which is called demonstrated interest. So on the back end, I'm going to go into um, software mode for a second. On the back end of the system, they are tracking all of these pieces of information that your students are sending in. And they're checking the boxes and they're being scored. There's something called a demonstrated interest factor, which really set is just tracking, okay, how much does this student really want to go here? If your student has never hit their website, never emailed them, never called them, never followed them on social media, there's big zero in there, right? So all of those online interactions are actually being tracked. Um, interviews are one of those demonstrated interest factors. So in addition to it being great that you could take an interview and do well, it's going to go down as, yes, they took advantage of this opportunity. The other piece about demonstrated interest going back to the application is if you have the opportunity to apply to a college through Common App or on their website. Obviously applying to the college through Common App is easier, but if it is your number one choice college and it is super competitive, <coughs> I'm gonna tell you, you go to that college's website and apply because you're gonna get more points and that demonstrated interest factor. And that is, it's just kind of part of the game on the back end, um, but you need to make sure that you are following them, you are responding to emails, you are doing everything because that stuff is actually being monitored now. Um, so interviews are important, be professional, be authentic, and once you have applied, you can take a deep breath for a few minutes, or the student does, and then you guys have to figure out how to pay for it. Um, and the statuses are pretty straightforward. So admitted is the easy one, deferred will be um, the one associated with the early actions and decisions. So they did not get accepted up front, but they could be as part of the regular pool. Denied, they are not accepted. And then waitlisted, um, they have not been denied or accepted, but they may be accepted off of the waitlist. Um, most colleges will email their decision at this point. What they're going to do is they're going to email that your decision is available and they'll ask you to log in to wherever you submitted the application. Um, there's very few that are still sending the old-fashioned you know, post notification. So back to the email. If your student does not do a good job checking email, this is more reason for a family email address. Um, Similarly, you know, they might be really good about checking emails when they know that the um, notices are coming out, but there's going to be an onslaught of um, messages once the, um, there's going to be an onslaught of messages once the acceptance has come out about you need to send this back by this date, this deposit, and this and that. So those are the ones that are very particular thereafter. If you miss any of those dates, they can pull the acceptance. Um, so just important stuff to know. And so anything on the application before we go into a uh, high level on the financial aid and financing? So yes. I have a question. So when, yeah. when they're supposed to follow these schools or whatever on mm -hmm. social media, yeah. Twitter, Instagram, whatever, is there, any, is there any time that the school might follow them back and see what they're doing on so, social media? I don't know that they follow them per se, but they are, I have a statistic somewhere. Um, it was a year old. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 25% of colleges say that they will check in on a student's social media profile from time to time. Um, so it's a point in time that they will check it. What we suggest is that you, every student should Google themselves and see what comes up um, and act accordingly. Um, so follow, no, check in on them, yes. Right. Yes. Um, could you just give a real timeline for when all this happened? What part? You know, <laughs> I say a common app, but you put all your applications yes. in the common app. Um, so it really depends on what you're applying for, but I would say it's you're like you're going to start October next year and go through February, but I'm going to defer to the back. Yeah, um, counselors, I'll, I'll finish up and talk about our yep. timeline to support you and your students. The common app, we encourage students, it's available now for them to start. I'm not encouraging them to start now. But the application is open. So this summer is my suggestion for students who are likely to apply early. Those early deadlines come early. 
um, October 15th, November 1, November 15th. So summer students have a little bit more time to create the application. Those deadlines for early do come early before the first quarter is over. So what grade? Seniors. I'm sorry. Juniors into summer to start. So when they summer come in, juniors. you got it. So when you come in to school in the fall, you created your list. You can add to it, subtract from it, but we encourage you. We'll introduce Common App to them through the health classes um, end of March. This year for June. If I remember correctly, the Common App usually, in most colleges as well, but the Common App usually refreshes around August 1st. No longer. No longer. Okay. Yep, two years ago, okay. they can start it now. They should. <laughs> okay. They should. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah. Just a quick yeah. question. When you mentioned the uh, online interactions, maybe track. Yeah. Then you also mentioned having like a family account. Does it matter what accounts they use, or yeah. it's yeah. all linked together? Yeah. 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 Yes. Especially if they have their own Facebook, LinkedIn, not LinkedIn, but Facebook, Twitter, any of that, it, they'll see them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So financial aid. Um, this is part about understanding affordability. It will actually tie back to the fit that we talked about early on as well. Um, so researching costs and financial aid starts now, and it's part of what you should be doing when you're building that college list. Um, anybody in here know what the net price means when we talk about the college price versus the net price? Awesome. Okay. So the cost of attendance is the price tag on the door. The net price is actually your cost. So the net price is what it costs you once they take all of your personal factors into account. So um, this is where your uh, 2019 tax return is going to be your best friend. You're going to want to leave that out someplace to refer to it in the future. Um, but they're going to ask all of the questions about that will lead to need-based aid, and they will start to ask questions that will um, get at whether there's potential merit-based aid as well. And they will make some reasonable assumptions. So the net price calculators are something that every college in the United States is required to have on their website. It's federally mandated, and that is so that it is very clear what the cost to you is. Um, it's going to ask those family finance questions. It's going to ask student academic questions. It will um, provide that personal estimated cost per family. Um, and it will also make some assumptions about the associated federal versus institutional aid. So this used to all be information that you know a long time ago you didn't get until after you were accepted. So you were really kind of accept you are submitting blind. Um, they make all of this available now to help inform whether or not you want to go through this process. Um, the merit-based aid part is really dependent on the college. So it depends on how much the college has invested into their you know whiz bang tool. Um, so if you have questions on the merit-based aid or you have a unique instance with your student. I work on the financial aid office, and they're usually, or the, the financial aid office, or likely um, the admissions office, they are more than happy to talk to you about potential options. But um, some schools will have the merit based aid calculations. Yes? Uh, you brought up having your 2019 taxes handy. I think they go two years back now. Potentially. I, I don't know the logistics. I just know you're going to need your tax returns there. So they may, for the calculator, I don't know though. For when you act, so when you actually submit the form, yes. For the calculator, maybe. No, not the calculator. Talk about so fast. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, definitely. Yes. So if you're juniors now and you're filing taxes to April 2020, um, it's prior prior year. So you know your income may change. The information you're submitting. It's very clear as to what tax form you are. That's changed. In years past, FAFSA wasn't available until January 1. Now you can start at October 1. So they've hopefully made the process simpler for families. Um, but it's easier if you get your taxes done. You can use estimates, but um, the process is, is straightforward. And that's where your kids need your help. Yep. And that is the FAFSA is the next piece on here. So 
one of the first things that you will do, and, and many of you will actually be completing the FAFSA before your student even submits their first college application. So October um, 1st is when the FAFSA is available. There's usually a national, well, there is always a national FAFSA day someday in October. Um, and the push is to really help people fill out the FAFSA. So you can go on the MEFA website and find out where there's one locally. What that means is that there are people all across the Commonwealth. You bring in your tax returns and they will help you fill out the FAFSA form on the spot. Um, the profile is still required by some private colleges. So if you're applying to a private institution, check the financial aid page. They might require a separate um, financial aid form. It's like the FAFSA, but it's something that private institutions require. And again, depending on the institution, they might require a separate financial aid application. For the most part, things are really driven by the FAFSA these days, but these are just the types of things that you have to identify and track. Um, and then in Massachusetts, there are additional options. So these aren't necessarily um, loan or tuition waiver programs, but they are things that make college a little bit more affordable. So the Commonwealth commitment and different tuition breaks, this one here is um, certain reciprocity agreements exist with like the state of New Hampshire and the state of Maine. So if your student is looking for a program that does not exist in a state institution in Massachusetts, they might be able to go to an out-of-state institution for an in-state price. You know, there was a maritime um, mechanics program for a long time that Massachusetts didn't have, and people used to be able to go to Maine for the same price. So things like that are good to be aware of. And then also the ability to transfer from a community college to a four-year college. <coughs> Um, there's you know certain requirements around that, but they're pretty. I would say they're pretty easy to achieve. You <laughs> need to go to a community college and graduate with an associate's degree in two and a half years, and, and maintain a minimum GPA in order to transfer um, for I think reduced or no tuition. So you know things that you will get more information on in the coming months but things are available. So just important reminders, here is the slide that you probably want, um, the timeline going forward. So yes, things start now in terms of research, campus visits, asking questions, um, but they really ramp up at the end of summer and into fall of next year. And with that, the only things that are left after this are plugs for Mika. So if you want to take over, I'd be happy to leave this up in the background. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you didn't pick one up on your way in, um, we appreciate, Mika appreciates the evaluation. You're on the table here. If you do complete it, please um, throw that on the table as well. Um, and if you didn't sign in, there is a sign in on the table. We appreciate that as well. Um, just in summary of what we do to help you and your kids throughout this process, um, what's on most of their minds right now is picking classes if you're juniors for senior year, right? Your Aspen window is open. Students are asked to do that by next Friday. Counselors will meet individually with your kids um, March 9th, March 20th. So if they don't come in in advance, we're going to them in classes. So that's part of the college application process, that idea of you know, rigor in your courses that you're choosing. So that's our immediate seeing of your kids. Um, next, after that, we're going to go into their health classes, which all juniors have this spring, and present about <coughs> when is it time to ask for teacher letters, what's going on in Naviance, how do you use that tool. Um, students and parents have Naviance accounts. If you don't have yours, just email the guidance department and we'll support you with that. Um, yes? I was going to ask, when you said teacher, uh, teacher letters, is that back to the recommendation? It is, perfect. So yeah. do the recommendations have to come from teachers? Or? So you do what the colleges ask you to do. Okay. Typically, two letters of recommendation from academic teachers. Okay. But you might find, you know, Gordon will want a, a personal letter mm -hmm. of reference. Um, so we will encourage students to go this spring to teachers and ask. And it gives the, the teachers the opportunity to write for students over the summer. They upload their uh, letters to Naviance. Counselors write on behalf of students if they'd like that. Um, we ask for participation and actually comments from parents. So there will be a point where you're invited to share um, some anecdotes from home that we may not know. 
um, that are helpful when we put the letters together for the students. So we encourage that to happen this spring. So we'll come into your health classes end of March, early April. In the past, we've hosted a college panel for students and parents in the evening. Um, we're doing something a little bit different this year. We're having that panel during the day. It will be April 1st. It will be advertised. Parents are welcome to come. It's going to be during Power Block. So we'll have admissions reps from, oh, large schools, small schools, highly competitive, the community college, um, just to talk to kids. Um, required for juniors to come and hear the story. And again, parents will be invited as well. Um, we move that to the day, and counselors in the work the week of April 6th will actually be available for evening appointments for parents. Um, so we're going to shift our hours and see how that goes, if that's helpful to you to come in and tell us what you're thinking for your kids. We're going to support them, but it will be nice for us to know, you know if that works for you. If you can't make it in, certainly we're available by phone. Okay, so those are some com things coming up in the near future. Um, in the evening, we will, as we have in the past, offer a, this is how we support you right now in the process. So everything now sounds familiar. You've heard it once, you'll hear it again. Students are living it, tweaking lists, et cetera. Um, so we'll talk about our support of the actual process, what we send, what they send. Um, and then we've been very fortunate in the past to have um, another representative for me to come and talk financial aid, and that's usually the end of September. So that's, that's it for this evening. Certainly we're here for questions. Um, but again, thank you very much. Thank you very much.